thanks everyone both here in Kelowna and joining us via Zoom uh, for joining us. This is, I'm, I'm Gordon Hodgkins, I'm the co-chair of the La Nostra Familia Italiana Committee along with Don Ramponi to my left. Uh, we've got Simone helping us out on the technical side. Uh, so they're the ones that are going to keep everything going smooth. Um, this is the last of our presentations this year. We've done six presentations. Uh, we've looked at Terrazzo. We've looked at Italians building irrigation. And we explored somebody whose uh, great grandfather was killed in Argentina. It, it, it's been a really exciting uh, series. And I have a particular place in my heart for, for today's presentation. Um, I've known the Vecchio well pretty much ever since I got married, I think. Uh, you're familiar, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think you're really going to enjoy the stories, the two stories that we're telling um, tonight. Before we dive in, I do want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Seal uh, people. This has been their, their land since time immemorial. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the Colonia Italian Club, um, our mission is to share and preserve Italian heritage. And that's what this committee is all about. We love to gather stories. We love to gather stories that really tell the story this got a bit, um, of, of the Italian contribution to Kelowna um, and the Okanagan and to share those stories. Um, and that's really the purpose behind it. If you aren't a member and you want to find out more about becoming a member, uh, we actually have our president right in the back, Roseanne, if I can get you to just put up your hand high, uh, that's Roseanne, uh, talk to her, or, or Don and myself after the, the presentation, we'll tell you a little bit more about the club. And we'll also tell you a little bit more if you're interested about our committee and, and our projects. Um, so, we're actually going to start. So my hometown is Calgary. Yay. <laughs> a big, a big yay, a singular yay from the audience. Um, and uh, our other guest, Maria Cioni, uh, is also from Calgary. Um, and Maria, I, I, I have to admit when I. When I was looking for the title for this presentation, I couldn't find a better one than the, than the one Maria used for the book she wrote uh, about her family and starting the, the first Italian restaurant in Calgary, Spaghetti Western. Like, you, you just can't do better than that. Yeah. So uh, Maria, apologies for, uh, for usurping the title of your book. By the way, I do want to give a plug for Maria's book. It is available on Amazon through Audible. So if you like to listen to your books, you can do that through Amazon. Uh, Maria, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. And hi, Joey. It's so exciting that we can share our stories of our parents tonight. It's, um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. One moment. Can everybody see this? Yes? Can you see? Yeah, we're good. Okay, so I'll just move along here then. So I, I want to start with a little history. I'm an historian. Um, we're going to the Romans, but don't worry, we're not going step by step up to my father's birth. We're going to the Romans because here we're looking at the major trade routes that <laughs> the Roman roads covered. And the circle is the Via Salaria or the Salt Road. And the importance here is that one day out of Rome on the Via Salaria, and it's, it's split there into a northern arm, was the town of Antridoco. And this is where my father was born. So from Roman times, Antridoco was used to welcoming strangers and giving them, for pay of course, food and accommodation. So this idea of hospitality was really became part of Antridoco's history. And I think that uh, has a bearing further on 
as, as I hope you will see. So I'm going to tell the story of my father with the grand name of Genesio Vincenzo Galdino Cioni. And here on the left, he is in grade four. And how does he come to be the originator of Italian food in Calgary? This is what we're going to talk about this evening. So that little boy there eventually turns into a chef. And here are key points uh, in my father's life. Of course, his birth in 1907 in Antrodoco. Um, I should note that I call it in Abruzzi because it's now officially in Lazio um, because Mussolini took it into Lazio. He liked the little town. He had um, uh, um, a kind of country house in the mountains above Antrodoco. But anybody who's from Antrodoco will still say it's in Abruzzi. Um, in 1916, um, well, my father had a, had a brother a year younger. And when he, my father was two years old, his father died, leaving a widowed mother with these two babies. And also she had to look after three older children from the first marriage of the father. So it was, it was a tough time, that's for sure, if you were a widow. In 1923, my father arrives in Calgary. And I'm just going to skip to um, tell you why. And this is because my grandmother, his mother, Fulvia, when she was widowed, it was a really hard go for her. And so what happened with many widows at this time is they sought to remarry. And she thought maybe to go to Canada. Why? Because um, my father's half sister, who was 18 years older, had gone to Calgary and married. So Fulvia had this model and she talked to people in the village and they said there was a paisano in Calgary who was a widower himself and the deed was done. They married. So he was quite a bit older than her, 12 years older. His name was An Anibali Corredetti. And he said, we'll marry and then I'll bring your sons over. But of course, he never did that. But Fulvia saved money for six years secretly in order to bring Genesio to Calgary. How would she do it? When she went to buy groceries at the little Italian grocery store, they'd pad the bill by a few dollars. Not enough so that uh, Anibale would notice, but when he come to pay the bill, he'd pay a few more dollars and then the woman who ran the store would give that back to my grandmother. So it took her six years to save enough money to bring him. And that is how my father got to, uh, got to Calgary. Wow. Um, so what age was your father when, when he got to Calgary? He turned 16 on the boat. And then once he got to Calgary, um, what, what did he do? Okay, I'm going back to my presentation here. Um, so this is just his landing papers in Canada. And for anybody doing genealogy or history, I can't stress enough looking for documents because you think you know the story, but you don't really. So for example, it says here he had $5 in his pocket and a ticket to go to Calgary to Fulvia Cardellini, his mother. So that was her maiden name, Cardellini. I knew that. Um, but you know, Fulvia, her name had many iterations in documents as maybe it won't surprise you, but I take it that it was Fulvia because my father said it was Fulvia. So please um, do look for documents. 
So when he arrived in Calgary, this is what my father found. So there were 425 Italians at the time living in two communities called Bridgeland and Riverside. And these were along the river, but they were with lots of other immigrants. So not just Italians, but an immigrant communities. And many um, of the Italians there had come from Antrodoco. So it was this idea of the chain migration. And um, several had come in the 1880s um, to build the railroad. And indeed the, the man that my father's mother married had come in that time and had built the railroad and then they stayed on rather than going back to Italy to live, they stayed there and um, brought um, either their families to them or um, they brought people they could marry and start their family there. So my mother, when my father arrived, he found that my mother had four Calgary born children and that she was also raising three children from her husband's first marriage. So Fulvia was a full-time <laughs> um, rear rearer of children. She had a lot of children. Giuseppe is my father's half-sister from Antrodaco. She was the one who had immigrated to Calgary in 1918 uh, to marry a man she did not know. Turned out to be a very decent man, a very nice man, an Italian. And by the time my father got there, she had five children of her own. So he arrived with kind of a, a family of sorts around him. And his stepfather said, you will immediately go to work. So what that meant in terms of the stepfather was you must immediately earn money. You're not staying in my house if you're not gonna bring in money. For my grandmother, she had a different plan. She thought, first of all, he will learn English. So he went to work at the Calgary Shoe Hospital, also run by a Paisano. And there he learned um, to speak English. And then he went to barber school because this was my grandmother's plan my father would have a profession. He wouldn't be a laborer. He'd have a profession. He'd be a barber. So here's a picture of him and barber school in 1925. Notice that it's called the Hemp Hill Barber College and the Hemp Hill Automobile Gas Tractor School. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they cover the spectrum here. And um, I think I'll stop here for a moment. Um, Gord, should I stop or continue? Yeah, actually, I just I want to ask you a few questions about <clears throat> what Calgary would have been like at that time. So you mentioned there were two kind of mixed immigrant communities along the river. That's what right. Would have, what would the population of Calgary have been in the early 20s? Okay, I'm just going to go back here. <laughs> See, we missed you here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead a couple uh, slides here um, because here's the data. So when he arrived, um, there were approximately 425 Italians and the population of Calgary was 63,305. This population of Italians, 425, remained constant because my father was amongst the last of the Italians to come into Canada. They stopped immigration because Mussolini didn't want people who um, to leave Italy. He wanted people there to work and bring the country back. And the Canadian government, quite frankly, didn't want any uh, Southern Europeans. Uh, if there was gonna be immigration, it was going to be from the North Germany or from the north or from Holland. So that 425 remains pretty constant. Um, we can just note at this time in Vancouver, um, 117,727. And um, 
the Italian population would have been, um, I'm just approximating around 3,000. So you see here the difference in, in the number of Italians in Vancouver vis-a-vis -vis the number of Italians in Calgary. Well, and just to give some Okanagan context to this, because we spent quite a bit of time with 1911 census records. So in the central Okanagan, uh, there was probably close to 350 Italians with a much smaller uh, aggregate population. Now, most of those had come to work on two projects, either the Kettle Valley Railway or putting the irrigation works in. Um, but it's interesting that you have actually a, a pretty small, tiny percentage of Italians in what was a fairly large, I mean, the population of Kelowna back in 1911, I'm completely guessing here, but I'm guessing the central Okanagan would have been somewhere around five to six, maybe 7,000 people. So we're talking one tenth size um, and probably almost half the Italians that, that Calgary had. Lastly, no, looking at 1911, we had twice as many Italians as Calgary had at the time. So, you know, um, and then with that chain migration, they, they probably had a very small nucleus that had chosen Calgary just because they knew Paisani there, correct? That's correct. But um, a bit of an anomaly here is that although there's 425 um, Italians in, in the early 20s or early to mid 20, 1920s, it was a population in flux because so many um, went to work in the mines in uh, around Fernie and that area or up north to Nordegg. And so the community in numbers was fluctuating because of the movement of people looking for jobs in mines and coming back and forth to Calgary and then going out again. So that isn't captured, but that was uh, part of the uh, characteristic of the community at the time. Yeah, and again, interesting because you're right in the middle of the sojourner period there where, where basically Italians are coming to find work and probably most of them intended to go back to Italy and buy land to increase their land holdings. Uh, their, their intention at that time probably wasn't to stay in Canada. A lot of them ended up staying there, um, as we found in the Okanagan. But uh, it's just, it's interesting how you're starting with a very small nucleus and probably not a lot of awareness. I think the other context we have to remember right now is we think of the world now and everybody wants to be a thousand, right? Like everybody loves Italian culture, everyone loves Italian food. That was definitely not the case in the period we're talking about. As as Maria said, um, Italians were pretty far down the list of desired immigrants. They were looking for English, they were looking for Scottish, they were less so looking for Irish, uh, but they were definitely or, or any Northern European. Um, and here in the Okanagan, they were encouraging resettlement from the prairies to the Okanagan. So um, this was not a culture people were looking for, which says something about the courage of people willing to bring this culture and bring this to a community that was largely unaware of it. Also, I should point out in the, um, in 1924-25, uh, it was a kind of a dim period um, particularly for Italians in Calgary, and I would say also um, in the interior of BC because of uh, Emilio Picarello. And they had the trial of, um, what was the woman's name um, who was tried? Yeah, I, I unfortunately can't remember. I can't um, either, but she was tried in Calgary. So it was like focusing <laughs> in Calgary on a bad, bad Italians that were being tried for murder. So the local Italian community was really, um, you know, they kind of uh, uh, laid low as best they could. Well, and, and let's remember too, um, between the 20s and the 30s, 
you've got fascism starting to rise in, in Italy too. Now, and I always stress this whenever we talk about fascism is don't look at fascism the way we look at it now in hindsight. Mussolini was well regarded by other world leaders right until he decided to invade Abyssinia. Um, so, but it, it, this period fascinates me because it, it, there's such a lot of pieces at play. And for those of you um, what Maria referenced, so Emilio Picarello was a, a, a bootlegger in the Crow's Nest Pass. And um, he ran into an altercation with a police officer. Um, the police officer ended up being shot and Emilio and his mistress were both tried for murder. Um, so that's, that was a sensational case at the time. And, and as Maria said, it was being tried in Calgary. Yeah, she found she was also found guilty and hanged, which is the first time they had hung a woman. So it was bad news, very bad news. Um, it, 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 this is a little bit off topic, but with all these soldiers coming in, you had a lot of talk about black hand society. You had a lot of kind of uh, mafioso and and the, these kind of stories. There was one story of KDR workers who grew up. Uh, Tell with dynamite uh, down in Boundary Country by uh, by Grand Forks. So um, <clears throat> it just kind of tells you what the animosity towards Italians in that time period was. Um, and we're going to be looking more into this, but the Okanagan was a bit of an anomaly in that. We're kind of digging into that story now, but um, I think that's largely because we had a lot of very early settlers. Um, in the Okanagan Mission, who were well respected, had well respected farms, the Casorsos, the Ramponis, the Barreras, the Black Francos. Um, and that created a nucleus of respect that wasn't always found in other locations in Western Canada. So I'm just going back here um, to show some influences my father. Unfortunately, uh, in 1927, uh, Fulvia, uh, his mother died. And seeing that my father didn't get on that well with his stepfather, he went and he stayed with Giuseppe, whose picture is up here in the right-hand corner, his beloved half-sister. And they were very close and she was a fabulous cook. She could make the most delicious things out of essentially a few bones, that, that kind of cook. So my father spent a lot of time um, watching her. She was teaching him technique. And one of the things he cooked very well because he learned from her was gnocchi. So he was learning the repertoire of the foods in Antridoco. At the same time, he um, knew he had to go to work. He didn't want to be a barber. And so at the time, there were a lot of Italians working at the CPR Palliser Hotel. And he was able to get a job in the kitchens at the um, Palliser Hotel. Um, you know, this is kind of the grand um, British style of hotel. And here, my father in the kitchen over the, a year or two, learned how to prepare the basics of British food, roast, soup, sauces, that kind of food. So my father had an education in the basics of, of, um, of the food that most people ate, although they didn't uh, eat it at the Palliser Hotel because it was far too expensive. Do you want me to go on, Gord? Uh, yeah, let's keep going. So my father, because the CPR had many uh, talons out, many arms, one of the jobs he got was here, oops, sorry, uh, was here on the left. Uh, he was a cook on the work train. So when, when they go out to fix track, They'd have a, a little car they'd put on um, and the men would sleep in the car and they'd also eat there. So my father learned to cook 
on these big wood stoves. So um, it's an art to learn to cook on these kinds of stoves, especially in this period, because there was little control. So you had to control it by the way you move the, the logs around and, and, and how they were being fired up. And so in 1931, he was on a work train in BC. And my father just, you know, he thought this was enough. So he needed a job. It's depression. So where does he go? He goes to Trail BC. Why? Because the smelter is there and it goes 24-7 and there's always work in trail. And besides, he had a very dear um, cousin there, Sophia Pacenti. So my father got a job at the Montana Hotel as a cook. And this is a hotel where miners would um, come and live. And, you know, they go out on shifts and always there was food to be prepared and to be eaten. And you can see the Italian style is still strong and alive <laughs> in the mid uh, 1930s during the Depression in uh, BC. This is my father and his uh, his friend, Tony Poscienti. Um, You can see the little diamond stick pin. And, you know, the, it, it's encouraging, I find, because it shows they still had an enjoyment of life despite the, the hard times that were there. So my father learned to cook at the uh, Montana in a way that was kind of regularized, you know, dinner here, breakfast there, lunch there. And he found too that he started to uh, insert some Italian recipes into the foods he was cooking for the miners. And it was very well received. And he'd also forage around there for, for nice vegetables and, and um, herbs and things of that sort. So he stayed in, um, he actually stayed in BC for a couple more years. He went to Vancouver um, because as we saw, there were thousands of Italians in Vancouver. It was like a Mecca. So his goal in Vancouver was to work in a restaurant because while he knew now how to cook a variety of foods, he could handle that. He didn't know how to manage uh, a restaurant, how, how to get staff and 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 look after staff and, you know, run a restaurant operation. And so he was lucky enough to find the Pini family who were from Abruzzo. And he went to them and he said, I want to work in your restaurant and they said no we have no money for you so he said I'll work for nothing if you give me room and board and you let me watch how you're doing things so that's what happens and my father's there for a couple of years and he returns to Calgary when he returns to Calgary he marries uh, Martha Arndt who is an American but you'll notice she has a solid German name and they have a son, Gary, born in 1940. Um, my father uh, was very lucky to get a job as the cook and manager of the Burns meatpacking operation. So during the war, Burns was operating 24-7 in the war effort, getting everything out. And my father was responsible for providing the food for the workers at Burns. Um, he didn't work 24 hours a day, but he organized that that be done, but he put in big hours. Um, he was declared an enemy alien, which really frightened and shocked him um, because, you know, he had now been uh, there about half his life was in Canada by this time, but he was an enemy alien. And he also worried about his family in Italy, his younger brother there and his, his relatives. So it was a tough time. The wartime psychologically took a lot out of my father. So at the end of the war, he got sick. He got um, uh, 
you know, he was laid low by sickness and I think perhaps depressed by all of his enemy alien <laughs> ideas. And he started following politics and he was very good supporter of the Liberal Party. Why? Because they determined that there should be Canadian citizenship. Before, um, before 1947, there was no Canadian citizenship. And so my father applied early on. And in November uh, 1947, he became a Canadian. And what this meant to my father was that he was now on equal ground with other Canadians. And he, was, he, he had a position as a Canadian in Canada. So things were going really well in Calgary. Um, there were a lot of working professionals in the period 48, 49, Calgary won the Grey Cup. They descended on Toronto with horses. They won the game. Everybody thought, who are these guys from Calgary? And so Calgary was a place now. And here we have uh, the Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent visiting Calgary and my father was in that crowd. And we have the petroleum industry now coming to Calgary. So not only in the fields did they have the wells, but now they had the managerial and financial infrastructure of all the big American oil companies in Calgary. So Calgary was very much a booming place. Uh, Gord, should I continue? Because we're about to have. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead. We're about to have the first Italian restaurant. My father called it Jean's Spaghetti Parlor. So parlor, this idea, part, come into my home, I'll feed you. That idea of hospitality that's in the antrodocal blood, come, you know, we'll feed you. So he opened Jean's Spaghetti Parlor, and now he's known as Jean. So no more Genesio, he's known as Jean. And this was in the basement of a rooming house that a Paisano uh, owned in Riverside. It had eight tables and he cooked on three, um, three hot plates, essentially. So that was the start of it. And a few months after he started, Primo Canera, who was the world boxing champion and it turned to wrestling now was in Calgary. And he came and he, he came to my father's restaurant. And my father says, what do you want? He says, I want everything. So my father literally cooked the three dishes that were on the menu. He cooked all three for him. And this brought awareness to all of Calgary that my father had this little restaurant. So much so that a year later, he left that and moved to a bigger place, uh, also owned by the same Paisano. And this time he opened Jean's Dine and Dance. Dine and Dance meant that there was a jukebox and people could get up on the floor and dance. But there's some um, culinary innovation here. One is that my father uh, asked for a big special grill to be built so that he could grill T-bone steaks. Steak, of course, was the favorite dish of all of Calgary, no matter you know, who you were, what you were, you, everybody liked steak. So for $3, he was offering a steak dinner and he prepared the steak in what became known as Jean style. That is, he brushed it with olive oil, with garlic, and he cooked it to a pink. So. Um, medium, uh, medium well done. And he served it with a side of mushrooms as well as other foods. Another innovation here is in the middle, you'll see Jean's special Italian dinner. It was really in the first iteration called the deluxe dinner. And you'll notice it starts with different uh, orders of food. So as the Italians would have antipasta and move on to primo, secundo, et cetera, this is what my father kind of 
imposed um, in an offering called the Deluxe Dinner. You got all these different courses. And he came up with something called spavioli. Spavioli was simply putting spaghetti and ravioli together on the same dish. So it was spavioli. <laughs> on the dish, it was spavioli. And what he did as well on the salad, uh, you can appreciate that during winter in Calgary, you didn't have a lot of tomatoes and other fresh vegetables. So he took an anchovy and he put it diagonally across the salad. And this absolutely made the Jewish community go crazy because they said, here's an Italian who puts herring on a salad. What could be better? So um, people flocked to the restaurant. Also, um, lots of sports at that time. Again, the Stampeders were big. And um, Sugarfoot Anderson um, was a dear friend of my father's. My father said that he had suffered, uh, you know, from people casting him aside and he would cast no one aside. So everybody was welcome at his restaurant. Should I keep going? Um, I, just a, a question for those of you. So Sir Fred Anderson is a, was a stampeder, right? Yes. Yeah, and he would have been a black stampeder. He was. Yeah. So yeah, I, I just think that's interesting to make note of because that. Yeah. yeah. Also, a chap named uh, Willie Strode who was in the movie Spartacus. He was the black gladiator in Spartacus. And he came and he played baseball for a year or two in Calgary. So the two of them were, were always at my father's restaurants. So just a question for you, Maria. Um, so I, I happen to have an uncle who fought in World War II uh, with the regiment out of Calgary, which I believe is the Princess Patricia, right? Yes, yes. Um, and he fought his way up through Italy, up through Sicily, and that, do you think the return of servicemen after World War II may have been in Italy and sampled Italian food might have been a factor in the acceptance of Italian cuisine after the war? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Also in America at this time, um, uh, it, uh, um, Italo, American Italian style was gaining a lot of uh, popularity at this time too. Again, for these same reasons, as you say, returning troops, it's good times. People want to forget about the war. They they want to go out. They they you know to the extent they can. They they want to have dinner and dancing. And there were a lot of young Italians who had been born in Calgary who were now professionals. Um, you know, my family has cousins who were very, uh, uh, you know, worked at the Bay and they like, you know, they were young professionals and they wanted a good time as well. Um, Go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, the partnership between my father and the Paisano didn't turn out very well. Um, and I, I'm not going into that, but my father closed, just left the restaurant, Gene Stein and Dance. He literally walked out of the place and then he determined he would go as far away from the Italian part of Calgary as possible. So I want everybody to look at this picture. There's kind of a ramshackle big house on the left. It's a dirt road, dirt gravel road. Who could look at this picture and say, this is so great. This is where my next restaurant is going to be. You have to be an optimist to look at this and to think that you could put a restaurant right here. But my father did. Here's the old house. We lived upstairs and the restaurant was in the downstairs. So you can see on the left how we made it over. It looks pretty simple and it was. Um, it 
the my the 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 customers followed my father. So even though it was a trek to get out here, people came. And my father renovated, you see the door at the back. He pushed that back to get another third uh, larger space. And that was the dance floor with the jukebox and the dance floor where people would dance. And on the right, here's a picture with my father. Um, uh, Rolly Miles is on my father's um, or on our left and Sugarfoot Anderson is on the right. And on next to Sugarfoot is a chap named Bob Mike, all football players. So here we are. And my father called this Jeans La Villa Supper Club. So now he's got a supper club. Before he had a dine and dance, now it's a supper club. And his idea was that people would come for dinner on the weekends, they dance, they party, and on Sunday, they would come back with their family, their children, and have dinner as my father and us had dinner, and my cousins would come for dinner. And so it was a family place on, on Sunday. So here, again, is the menu. Uh, I just want to point out there's pizza in 1953. My father grudgingly added pizza to the menu because of demand, but also he he begrudged it because it took a lot of time to do the pizza. And of course, people had to wait for it, um, but they did. And, and so pizza was a big hit um, from 1953 on. I'll also point out that there were things like Mexican hot tamales and Lipton's noodle soup. Why? because the kids of um, in the families that came on Sunday, this is what they knew and this is what they asked for. Here's our, our extended family. And I want to say um, that some of my cousins in this photo are with us tonight. And also very dear cousin, uh, Barbara and Jackie, um, on, on my mother's side are also here tonight. And, and I'm very thankful they've come to, to hear the story once again. So to recap, this is what people thought Italian food was up until around 1952. And then they started to get the idea that it was a lot different. And we moved into ethnic cuisine, as Gorda said, Italian food, nobody knew it. My father um, had to educate people to the tastes of Italian food. They would ask his opinion. He would give them tastes of things. For many of my father's customers, the ones that weren't of Italian heritage, my father was the only Italian they knew. So I'll give you a second to think about that. He was the only Italian they knew. So that put a lot of pressure on my father, needless to say, but he also took the responsibility of trying to, in very subtle ways, um, inform them about, about Italian food and culture. And so here we are at the end of the presentation. We now have Gene, a Calgarian, but in his journey, he managed to teach himself about cooking and what it took to run a restaurant and to eventually open the first Italian restaurant in Calgary. Thank you. So, Joey, how much of that resonated with you as you were listening? I love the part where she showed that desolate road <laughs> and her father choosing that place because my mom and dad, they uh, started Al's Cafe in Linfield and five businesses in the entire area. And uh, it, it was back in the early, early 50s. My father said the, um, the busiest 
Highway 97 was, was when Joe Casorso herded his sheep and his cattle <laughs> down Highway 97. And I actually have it on uh, an eight millimeter film. Oh, and there's the sheep going down Highway 97 in front of Al's estate. <laughs> Um, it struck me, and we've talked quite a bit about, about your, your mom and dad and, and the family story. And it struck me when Marie was talking too that this wasn't a restaurant, this was a cultural hub, it was a community hub in, in both cases. It was a place where people felt welcome and they just hung out because they wanted to be there. And that was very much the story of Alice Gaffrey. Oh, they called it the. Um... The teen hangout, the Winfield Institution. Um, my favorite is that it was called uh, Winfield's first community center because it had everything that it's young kids good. would want. There was nothing in Winfield mm -hmm. for them. So right off the bat, my dad um, they bought the first radio. So that was that was huge. Everyone would go to Al's Cafe to have something to eat and to listen to the radio. And then he had the first television in the area. So that was something that a lot of kids had never seen before. Only one channel, but... And then he um, installed the jukebox. So all the famous songs were playing at the restaurant. He had a comic book corner. My parents really loved it. So they really wanted to offer them something to do. So even though my dad was supposed to be selling these comics, the, Rutland, the Winfield kids were allowed to grab as many comics as they wanted. And there was a special booth, a comic book booth, and they would read all the comics all Saturday afternoon. The comic book salesman wasn't happy, but... <laughs> Um, and then they purchased a couple of pool tables, and then they had a billiards, billiards room downstairs. That was the thing to do for not women, the men and the teens would go down to the pool hall. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, with the jude box, the kids, well, and I'm getting some of this information from people who wrote uh, either letters or put into newspaper articles that uh, on Friday and Saturday nights, the teens, they'd sit at the booth like all night sharing one plate of 25 cent French fries. And once it got dark and they, <laughs> my dad would actually, get the people to move their cars away from the parking area. He had an outside speaker. And so the young kids would go out and dance all night in the parking lot outside of Alice the Bay. And uh, one of the waitresses who, who lived just down the road said, yeah, and I know that when we ran out of coins to go into the Wurlitzer, and I'll just kept the music going. <laughs> so yeah, Al's Cafe was the hub of Winfield. It was the landmark, it was the gathering spot, and it was the first community center where the kids could gather, meet up with each other, eat, dance, and it was all in a safe environment for them. Um, maybe let's start the slideshow. We, we, uh, Joey gave us some pictures, which we put together into a, a bit of a slideshow. And we'll just, we'll just kind of talk sure. to some of the pictures. So if we back up a couple slides. No, sorry. So that's Al's Cafe. It was also a bus depot. Right. Mom and dad uh, got the license to be a Greyhound bus depot. So passengers got on and off, and we handled parcels. And we had a special cash register. So the old original cash register 
became the Greyhound bus cash register and they updated all the cash register for the restaurant. However, back then, didn't tell you how much change to get back. You had to have the math skills to, to do that. So just to get our bearings, because um, obviously the building's not there, if we were in Winfield, Bay Country right now, where was Alice Cat? When you enter Winfield, there's um, Beaver Lake Road, and I think now it's a Shell Station. It's about a block away, on the right hand side, and it's a professional building, and it has a clock. So that's where Alice Cafe was. So pretty much, it, as much as Winfield had a downtown. That was it. Downtown. That was it. And that piece of property um, was just down the hill from where my mom and her family lived. And um, they bought the land for $150 and they built Alice Cafe for $2,100. It always fascinates me when we talk about um, making these big life decisions about buying land or buying something, the husband, wife, dynamic in there. Who was the one who kind of made sure that this purchase happened? Oh, they were such a good pair. They, oh boy, that's a hard one. <laughs> do I give it to my mom or do I give it to my dad? They, they were just a team. They were a team. Mom, uh, mom didn't know anything about Canadian cooking. So that's where the spaghetti and meatballs came. First um, sign, it says spaghetti and, and meatballs. That only lasted until mom left the restaurant in 1956. Um, that's when they built our family home in, in Rutland. So the Italian food went off the menu because dad was there by himself and he looked after the grill. So when they first uh, when they first opened. My mom didn't know what a hamburger was, french fries. That was totally foreign to her. So she had looked after the Italian food, dab with the grill. And how did Lake Country respond to spaghetti and meatballs? Something that you couldn't find in a restaurant, as far as we know, anywhere in the open market. I know. Uh, and I, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but they made a lot of money. So <laughs> it was <laughs> to go up. It took out that and it did okay. But in, in addition to the restaurant, they also sold um, <coughs> groceries, cigarettes, magazines. So that was a form of income as well. And the pool hall. And the green. I think your iPad is serenading us, Don. <laughs> yeah. Turn on. I'll let you get back to the beginning. So let's let's talk about let, let's meet Albert and Maya now and talk a little bit about their story. So let's go ahead and let's slide. Okay, so my um, father's parents were born in uh, Grimaldi, which is a town in uh, Calabria in Italy, and uh, they immigrated to Fernie coal mines. That's what the was the work. Available there. Dad was born in 1922, the year they arrived, and he worked in the coal mine. Um, and in 1946, he um, came to Kelowna, followed his sister, Sam and uh, Antoinette Porco. They had a pool hall here in Kelowna. And Dad's first job here was working in Cap Capozzi's uh, grocery store. And I think Dad got a taste of of business, and he decided he wanted to work for himself. My mom was very independent. Um, well, let, yeah, 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 there's dad, and that's downtown, and down, 1946. That's Bernard, right? Yeah. And that's, it, Albert is sitting on his dad's lap there. Yeah. So that'd be 19, 1923. Okay, let's go ahead. Because so, he was all, always entrepreneurial, even in Fernie. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so tell us about spick and span cleaners. He had a number of 
on jobs, but nothing really caught his attention. I think he always wanted to be uh, his own employer. When he got to Winfield, his first job was, uh, actually it was like a first the first food truck. He had a big balloon tire bicycle with a huge basket and he'd fill it up with pop and cigarettes and chocolate bars and he would ride his bike to all the construction sites and uh, different areas where they were building the highway and made money that way while my mom worked in the packing house. So between those two jobs, they saved their money and then so decided it, they were going to go into business. Was, was it just the fact, like, why a restaurant? Why not some other business? Was there any connection with cooking previous or was that just the hospitality right like mom was mom was always a good cook um but both of them were social people they liked people and um yeah okay i think your mom is next so let's go ahead yeah there's i um, if you want yeah that's the side of the restaurant um she's down the hill there's no steps there yet, and that little side door ends up being uh, the pool hall. But she started way back being homesteading in uh, Golden. Which so, we, we have a picture of that. Yeah, that's ahead. coming up. So she was born in um, uh, Cleto, Calabria, in southern Italy. Southern Italy was very poor. Um, my grandfather, he went to, uh, he immigrated, he was all over the United States and Canada for 11 years. So my mother uh, and her sister, Elsie, who ends up being a land pony, um, they, they didn't know their dad when they finally came to Canada because he was gone for so long. Um, none of them knew any English. At the time, the Canadian government was offering free food Free food, sorry, free land to anyone who homesteaded the property. So they, my, my mom and Auntie Elsie, they cut, uh, they logged. They logged with my grandma Russo. They had a horse. Let's go to the and next they one. They logged um, the tie and made ties for the railroad company. And so, so this is are. Ida and Elsie. Yeah. In Golden. Yeah, hunting. With a moose, yeah, right, and that—that's what they lived on as far as uh, meat. There's another shot where they had um, um, sheep and uh, and goat. So they did that, made money through cutting the ties, and uh, moved to Winfield in 1946. And it wasn't too long before. Um, Val Ramponi and Albert Vecchio heard about these two Italian girls living in Winfield, <laughs> and they would hop on their bicycles, <laughs> ride their bikes to Winfield, and the story is, my Uncle Val said to Albert, I'll take the short one, you take the tall one. <laughs> <laughs> So else they became the spot for all all the relatives and all the friends. Mom and dad were there 24-7. So if anyone wanted to visit with them, they'd have to go there. Mom and dad lived in the back of the restaurant, like Maria was saying, she, her family lived top floor. Mom and dad lived in two rooms at the back of Al's cafe where I was I was born when they were still there and they didn't build the house in Rutland until I was three years old. So there was a table that was reserved for family. And I kind of like to imagine how all these um, English descendants in Wingfield took upon this rowdy Italian family waving their arms and it's probably their first uh, experience with Italians. Well, that's like Maria said, like yeah. right, in a lot of cases, her dad was the only Italian yes. people family the restaurant knew. 
And I want to talk a little bit about chain migration because I think with, with your mom in particular and your grandfather, like um, Maria was talking about how this chain migration happened with their region of Italy. I think your grandfather was probably the first Calabrese to come yeah. to, the, to this area, yeah. right? And then set in, in motion this chain of migration that basically half the audience here tonight <laughs> is here because of that chain starting yeah. with your grandfather. Yeah, John Russo. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. And in that time period, uh, Southern Italy was very poor. And so almost all of the immigrants during that time came from the South. Now, earlier, I think the earlier um, wave, a lot of the Italians came from the North, but um, just before World War II broke out, and then after, then a lot came from Calabria. There was nothing there for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, and certainly, I mean, when we, it's funny, when we look at, Specific to Kelowna's migration pattern, it pretty much follows Italy from north to south. We've got, yes, mm -hmm. we've got the, the Piemonte, Asti, Friuli region in the beginning, and it kind of moves down to Tuscany, and then after the war, it really moves to the south. Um, Calabria, Sicily, but you know, we, we, we almost watched that migration work its way. So, and the Okanagan was the place to come because. We have the weather for farming, for orchards, and that attracted a lot of the people from Calabria. I think the next picture is, I believe, a wedding picture. So when did your parents get married? Uh, 1948. 1948. So right around when they were starting the restaurant. They actually started the restaurant when they were engaged. So they were committed. Were they allowed in the <laughs> kitchen together? <laughs> no. And then, so I got, started the, I got out, the order mixed yeah, up. I should have this slide first. Then. So it first started just being a wooden building, and then they saved their money and they were able to stucco it. Um, we talked about the sign. I think that's the next slide. Yeah, if you look carefully, right at the bottom, it says spaghetti and meatballs. And we didn't have any, there were no menus. There were no menus. I can remember we had one of those um, uh, Pepsi signs where you push in the little letters. But before then, it was uh, Blackboard. So, no, no paper, no paper. So would, that, is, would Al's Cafe have been the only restaurant in the field at the time? I, I want to say yes. Later on, I know there was another restaurant down towards Oyama. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting with the food because you basically, like Maria talking about the fact that they have lifted soup on the menu, you kind of have to cater to the taste of the people coming in, right? So your dad man the grill, so it was burgers and steaks. He also cooked steaks. T-bone steaks were a dollar, and uh, <laughs> fish and chips were 50 cents. So that's for the Right, right. And then spaghetti and meatballs, as long as your mom was involved. <laughs> yeah. After that, the Italian food portion kind of... Dad couldn't handle both. No, no. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about, I guess, it... I'm intrigued by this idea of this becoming the hub of the community. And I think in both cases, is it part? I know from being married into an Italian family for almost 35 years now, all the really good conversations happen around the kitchen table, right? Everything happens around the table. Everything happens when we have people over, they're all jammed into our kitchen. Yeah. We actually have to herd them to the living room because that seems to be the center of the community in the Italian culture, right? Um, is that why a restaurant with a bunch of tables just became the, the place to go in Winfield? I think so. Um, my dad's story, well, they called it uh, the morning bowl sessions. So I guess my dad would 
watch over all the locals would come in the morning and they would discuss all the gossip, world news, local news, and it was called Albert's Bowl Sessions. And it was around the table after breakfast, coffee. And interestingly enough, like let's go 10 years after dad sells the restaurant, he's sold it in 75, uh, the local radio station started a on location morning show copying my dad's bowl sessions and it was uh axel cruikshank and uh oh it's really quite funny he did that for quite a few years that wasn't no, there but it was really interesting another reason why it was the center was that dad started um the fire department the volunteer fire department so it, the headquarters was Al's Cafe. And I remember that there was, there was a phone up on the wall, and just like, you know, the emergency red phone that the president's answer when there's a war. Well, there was this phone on the wall, and when that phone rang, that meant there was fire. So dad would answer this phone, and then he'd put on the siren, which was on a speaker outside of the restaurant, which also doubled as music for the dancing that the kids outside. <laughs> and, and so all they called it the 30, 30 uh, bucket brigade of Winfield. And dad coordinated that until I think it was 1975 when Winfield actually got their volunteer. Would people come from Kelowna or even up in Vernon to, to have? Yeah, oh, okay. right. It was the center, right? Anyone traveling, it was the truck stop too, right? So it attracted a lot of people on the road. And like you said, I, I don't think there was many Italian restaurants around. Um, you, you made a note here. Uh, your mom and dad gave everyone credit. Yes. So yes. as long as you paint your tab at the end yes. of the month. And my dad kept that up when we opened Cafe Bella Viva, which was a restaurant specializing in uh, Southern Italian food. It was located in Rutland. Dad continued that. So we had lots of customers who had a running tab as long as they paid at the end of the month. Let's go ahead and uh, at least one slide, maybe two. So that's them in the early 50s. Let, let's keep it on this slide. You mentioned that they were such a good working unit. They worked together. Like, as we, a lot of us know in here, running a business can be stressful, like a family business. The whole family, I'm, I'm assuming the whole family was involved. Before you built the house in Rutland, where did you live? In the back of the restaurant. Okay. So I lived in the back of the restaurant until um, I was three. And, and uh, then I went to work for my dad when I was 14. And how was that? I loved it. Yeah. He even paid me minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole lot of immigrant parents that didn't pay their kids to work. I felt very fortunate. A dollar fifty an hour. Yeah. Um, what was the relationship, the working relationship like between your mom and dad? As far as business decisions, where are we taking the restaurant? What are we going to do? I think mom was more of a risk taker. And I think dad was more um, conservative. My mom loved land. Like a lot of immigrants, land is everything. So if my mom had her way, she would have she bought everything. And I remember hearing my dad, but Ida, we have to pay taxes. The land has to make an income. And so they compromised. Mom bought property and dad built rental units or commercial buildings on it. Right. So you had, I mean, you had on the highway in 97 in Rutland, you had you had health cottages, right? And then where you are in Rutland, they built uh, rental units there as well. And um, your aunt Elsie went down the same path with Val. Yes. Yeah. In and Gitch Bossio, Amonzo Bossio, he followed 
in my dad's uh, footsteps. In fact, he used the same floor plans for his kids <laughs> as dad did for his. Because I want to talk a little bit about about those cottages because it was wasn't just a way to make income from the land you were on. It, it was also a way to give a helping hand to new people coming over, right? And back then, it was very hard to find nice, cute little places to live. So I know Auntie Elsie and Uncle Val. They had many a relative stay in their units that had come over from the jungle. So many audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see a few hands waving. Um, let's uh, let's go ahead a slide. Uh, one more slide. So there's the family. I can't say the whole bean, but that was on Leithen, right? No, that was on McCurdy. McCurdy Road. And we made our name from uh, introducing something called uh, Ponzerotti's to the area. Um, five years after we opened, they, um, I can't remember whether it's Pizza Hut or some restaurants started offering Caltones, Calton, but they were, uh, they were oven baked and ours were deep fried. So we had a lot of people coming just for the Ponzerotti's. We had a banquet room upstairs, so we had lots of weddings, Christmas banquets, um, large groups upstairs. You know I'm going to ask about the uh, the, the design, the, the serving design there. Explain. The dress. Oh, the Italian <laughs> costume. Yes, of course. Well, <laughs> I must say, you're looking very confident modeling at that. <laughs> yeah, mom made us wear those costumes <laughs> for years. <laughs> but it was kind of hard to talk into talk our waitresses into wearing them, but for the first few years. And it was actually copied from what we used at the uh, Canadian Town Club here. And the same lady at uh, Edna Pugliese thing was the one who um, sewed all the skirts and the yeah. vests. Yep. Which is a perfect segue into the next slide because your mom and dad were also very involved with this club. So tell me a little bit about that. Oh, once they had free time from the restaurant business, the Italian club just fulfilled them in every way. It was social, they could help, uh, the community, like when dad was president, they did so much fundraising for the hospital for the you know, Boys and Girls Club. And mom loved being with kids, so she was actively involved with the Italian school, the Italian dancing, and uh, the Italian club in 1977. They created such a fantastic folk fest presentation that they won um, the BC award and for, for the best cultural presentation. And they were all flown to Nova Scotia for the national. And most of the people here, most of the people who went were my relatives. <laughs> <laughs> That's what made up the Canadian Italian club. <laughs> And, and yeah, you've got, uh, yeah. So, um, unfortunately, we don't have your mom and dad with us. When, when did they pass? Um, mom left in 1999 and dad in 2006. But if, if we talk about legacies, they left a huge oh. legacy. Tell, tell me about some of the, the people who have come to you um, to tell you how much Alice Cafe meant. Well, when Alice Cafe closed, there was a um, flurry of um, articles in uh, not only the Kelowna paper, but the Winfield paper. And that really warmed my heart. 
um, reading about how Alistair Bay was such a, a big part of um, their lives. And um, about 20 years after um, the big heyday of Mr. Bay, this stranger came to the door and asked for Al, called my dad. My dad came to the door and dad obviously didn't recognize him. And this gentleman says, you don't recognize me now, but I'd like to give you something. And um, he gave my dad a $100 bill, which back then was, was a lot of money. And my dad looked confused. And it ended up that this gentleman was one of the young people that hung out at Al's Cafe. And he said to my dad, Al, this is for always being there. And that just... Just said it all. Wow. Yeah. I mean, like from the bit I knew you, they were like everyone's favorite aunt. Right? Like, you've always, like my wife will tell the story of your dad making sure the kid got ice cream. Oh, ice like, cream. Getting into it. Even kids, when my kids, when it's five minutes to supper, go to Nana and Papa's. He's gonna give you ice cream, he's gonna give you chocolate bars. And he was like that in the restaurant. I don't know how many free ice cream cold, but see, mom and dad just love kids. So they knew how to get ice cream, chocolate bars. Still works, <laughs> still works. Um, and again, another story I told this one about your, your mom and her sister, they would challenge the young boys to have a uh, log skating contest and they would usually beat them. So they would hand skin logs and actually beat the young guys because they could do it faster than them. They were tough women. They really were. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing your mom and dad and your story. Um, I think it, it was a really I think both stories, both Maria's and yours, really, I think, tells us how, even though small in number, big in contribution, the Italian community has been in two very different communities, but a lot of parallels. Um, and I think it's, you guys definitely punch above your weight when it comes to hospitality. It, it, it's, it's a huge contribution. Um, and it really, I think, made a difference two communities that will last forever. So well I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to honor my mom and dad. I'm really proud of them. Thank you. And I thank them for everything they've done, not only for our family, but for our community. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Maria, I, I just wanted to give you a chance. Um, this is probably the first time you've heard the story of Al's Cafe in full. I just wanted to give you the first chance to kind of add any commentary or anything that you recognize from, from Joey's story. Well, Joey, thank you for the story. It, it was, it was wonderful. And it, to me, it, you know, the, your parents, my parents, they had a spirit that would not be denied, right? <laughs> they, they were going forth, whatever. And I like that you said your parents were a team. My parents were a team as well. And I don't know, you know, that they, they made such an impact doing what they thought was the right things to do and um, the communities that they lived in really were better for it. That's for sure. So thank you for your story. Yeah. It, it, Maria, I think they were just doing, they were being true to themselves. They were just doing what came naturally. And I think, you know, everything that we talked about tonight came from them just doing <laughs> what they knew, right? And what felt right. Um, 
Does anyone in the audience have uh, a question? Dominic. Dominic. How would we know? Not a question. Not a question to Joey yet, but I'll get there. Comment, oh, but to Maria, uh, there's a real connection between the 1949 Calgary Stampede team, the one for 48, I think, 48 or 49, the one the Great Cup. And I remember the quarterback and offensive lineman ended up coaching the Catholic high school football team in Kelowna at Matthew <laughs> And they, I remember, because I was at school at the time, and they would say they would eat at this Italian restaurant. No connection that it was uh, your dad's restaurant. So a real connection. Wow. They, they were they were very prominent in the football community. And they were both, both Cliff Cleaver and uh, John Aguirre were from Southern California. So they went to Calgary and ended up in Cologne. So I, wow. I'm glad to meet the, the restaurant family. And to my cousin, Joey, and the one thing she kind of omitted was how important Alice Capri was to the whole political climate. Because every politician that went by Alice Capri would sit in that corner booth. And going back to the early 60s, it was a formation of the, the regional districts in the province. All the, the key players were Alice Capri. Every election, all the politicians, provincial, federal, went to Alice Capri. So it was really a hub of how it, how it created uh, late country, but also how it created the, the Okanagan because everybody went there to get the scoops of the area. So it was a real thing. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from here in the audience? Anybody online? Zoom? Uh, a lot of thanks. Um, to oh, Joey wow. for sharing the story. Um, if anyone that online does want to ask a question, you can just unmute yourself and, and ask. Um, if not, I'll give it a second to hear if we hear anyone. If not, uh, first of all, uh, a big... <laughs> oh, there is someone. Hi. So Hi. I'm... I'm Maria's cousin. Um, my name is Jackie and I live in Calgary. And um, I was wondering, Joey, are, was your father related to Batista Vecchio who lived in Trail? Cousin. Cousins, because. Yeah, there's a Bat Vecchio, which was his brother, but he lived in uh, Bernie and then Nelson. The trail bat mm -hmm. is um, a cousin. Okay, because I'm an Amante, so oh. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we have connections going yes. both ways. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, bat was my uncle. Do I click on chat? And also, my father and his brothers also worked at Spick and Span. Cleaners, because they came from Fernie. <laughs> small world. Yeah, wow. small world. <laughs> yes. So we'll we'll talk more about that when I come to the conference in October. Um, so yeah, I should mention um, the Italian Canadian Archive Project, which Maria is involved with, uh, is bringing their conference to Kelowna in October. Um, so you'll have a chance, hopefully, to meet Maria uh, in person here. Uh, and Jackie. <laughs> Jackie. So. Um, Hello? Hello? Sorry, I think Hello? Sharon. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Chiara. I'm cousin, I'm Joey Vecchio's <laughs> cousin. I just want to say, Maria, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, and cousin, you were amazing. Maria, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I am the granddaughter of Angelo Mayo from Trail, BC, who owned the Kootenai Hotel. Mm -hmm. I grew up from the age of eight in my grandfather's hotel. She doesn't have any. It was amazing upbringing. I had to chuckle when my cousin Joey said she worked for $1.50 an hour. Her dad and mom paid her. 
my grandfather, the only, the payment that I got was $1 an hour. And in order for me to participate in school activities, or uh, I'm a real fan of hockey, I had to prepare pizzas, great, like, I can't even recall how many of those big boxes of mozzarella cheese, grate them by hand and put them into ice cream buckets. And that was my ticket to the hockey game. But I'm telling you, my grandfather in his hotel, he had rooms upstairs because we had the bar, the pizza house and Jojo's, chicken and Jojo's and upstairs the kitchen, the spaghetti house. And we had men that would uh, stay in rent from my grandfather who worked at Kaminko. Yep. And of course, when he supported baseball and hockey in the community, but from um, when hockey teams came from outside of Canada, guess where they stayed and guess who fed them? My grandfather. It was a home base you met at the Kootenai Hotel. So I just loved your story, Maria and cousin Joey. I'm in awe. I had gone through some of your stuff. So bless you both. And just wonderful, wonderful information. Thank you. Thank Kiara. you. Kiara, do you know the Poshenti family in trail? I do. I know the name. I remember as a little girl, them coming to the hotel because along the strip of Rosalind Avenue, that's where they fir the Italians first immigrated. Mm -hmm. They came into Rosalind Avenue. So we had the Montana Hotel. We had the Rex Hotel. We had the Trail Hotel. And then at the bottom of the Kaminko Hill, the old road was Grandpa's Kootenai Hotel. Now, Grandpa bought the hotel from the Pisa Pia's uh, family. So he was second, and then he brought in one of his nephews and another friend. And then they both left, and Grandpa took over. And while Grandpa had the hotel, he also had a farm, which is about a half an hour out. And I'd have to go with him, and we'd, we had chickens and cows, and he had the house out there, too. So, I mean, I had an amazing, an amazing upbringing. And just, um, I'm just not... Um, I need to make it a priority because cousin has been on my case. Get that documented. Get it documented. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I'm excited. It's just getting down to making it a priority. Yeah, just just start simply and it'll yeah. go because like you told me, uh, my story intersects a little bit with your life. So yes. you're going to find so many people once you start that this is the case. And the same with Joey, same with all of us. It's part of the excitement of starting to put your own um, records in order. Order. Say. That's yeah. for sure. Yes. So thank Great. you. Thank you, Kiar. I think we have a question from Sandy. Well, not a question, actually. It's just a comment, Kara. Um, I just moved to the Okanagan in Vernon from Trail, where I was born and raised. And the Kootenai Hotel was, yes, a landmark in the area for sure. So it's it's just the connections of the Italian community all across BC is just, and Calgary and Canada, I guess, is just amazing. You start talking to one person and there's connection after connection after connection after connection. And it's just, um, I'm really enjoying the Italian, the Kelowna Italian Club and the connect, just the connectivity because I've left my home um, of 60 plus years. And uh, it's just interesting to hear stories that go back to it as well, even though I'm not there anymore. So thank you very much, both of you for sharing. It was very interesting. And you know what I have to say, um, I never was in, uh, my grandfather and a couple of the relatives had originally started the Grimaldi Club. Grandpa was instrumental and it was a men's group. 
And then they would do fundraising and so forth for the community. But they'd also then for the children, you know, there'd be a Christmas party and Easter. And then grandpa at Birch Bank, if you remember Birch Bank, grandpa would gather and there would be relatives that would cross the border from Spokane, Washington. And they'd come up and um, and um, celebrate and spend the day, you know, it would be a Sunday where every, all the family and friends would gather. And of course, guess who would be in the kitchen? Grandpa and myself and some other relatives, you know, connecting everyone. So yeah, it's been an amazing journey for me. Um, yeah, I'm so proud to have come from trail. And, you know, talking about the vecchios like Batista Vecchio, well, Mr. and Mrs. Vecchio were worked at my grandfather's uh, restaurant or hotel in the, um, I'm just trying to think of Mr. Vecchio. Cousin, what's um, Gary's um, dad, what was Gary's dad's name and his mom? Do you remember? No? no? Okay, that's okay. But anyway, it was funny because he was the bartender. He would help bartend with my grandfather. And um, Mrs. Vecchio would be in the kitchen in the either upstairs in the spaghetti house or downstairs in the pizza. I mean, we could go on all night about this reconnecting with Trey. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sandy. Joey, this sort of proves that if you weren't related before you started the event, if you're related by the end of the event, you're going to be able to. Thank you very much, both Joey and Maria. Thank you. I want to mention that um, the, the club is actually working on an exhibit with the Kelowna Museum that will be starting on September 23rd, and this story will be part of that. What we want to do is really encapsulate the 140 years of Italian contribution in the central Okanagan. Uh, it'll be a major exhibit that will be lasting right through till January. Um, and what we're looking for um, is items that have stories attached to them. We're looking, it can be an everyday item. It could be just something that was passed down from your Nona or your Nona. Um, it may have been something they brought over from Italy with them because they wanted to make sure they had it in the new world. But these items are going to be a big part of the exhibit because we're not only collecting the items, we're collecting the stories attached to those items. So I'm going to plant that seed with you. Think about it. Um, it, it it'll be, uh, I think, a real time for us to, to um, share more of these stories with the general public. Um, so just a little plug. Um, Don, you, you already thanked our presenters. I, throw, I personally thank both of you. Um, I knew this was going to be a special evening, um, and you guys definitely delivered. Um, I want to thank our technical crew, Don and Simone. Uh, once again, you pulled it together. You guys, if you've never run a hybrid in-person Zoom meeting, I will tell you, their time. There's a lot of moving pieces, and we have done well, six of them now. Um, and there's always a new wrinkle. Every time we do it, there's always a new wrinkle, but uh, <laughs> Don's got his thinking notes. Hopefully, we manage to hang on to them until next season. And we will, we're still putting our, our kind of 23 24 season together. Uh, we haven't decided how aggressive or ambitious we're going to be yet, but that'll be coming soon. If you aren't uh, on our mailing list, uh, go to our website, sign up for our mailing list. We do a good job of letting you all know uh, what's coming up. So, uh, And could I mention, if anyone's interested, I've got some artifacts from Al's Cafe, from 45 records to the 78s, to the part of the comic book collection that I took home with me. <laughs> <laughs> the cash register was too heavy to carry to bring over here, but... We I still have the original huge radio that mom and dad had at Elf's Cafe. We'll and the cash notes. We will make sure that there's a piece yeah. of Elf's Cafe in the exhibit as well. Yeah. Um, so, and thanks all of you for supporting our series. Um, this is this is a big part of our mission at the club, and, and thank you for helping us support it. Um, so those of you who are here are welcome to stay for treats. Uh, those of you who are joining us
from Zoom, go to the fridge and grab yourself <laughs> a glass of wine and uh, some cheese and crackers and celebrate in kind. Uh, Maria, thank you again. Uh, Maria is joining us from Toronto, so it's getting fairly late for her. So thank you for uh, braving the time change for us. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, a big round of applause for everyone. Thanks, Gord. Bye, Joey. Bye, Maria. We'll meet soon again. And I hope to see a number of, of the people that were here in uh, Kelowna, as Jackie said, when we come for the conference in October. I've put a little note in chat about it. Thank you. Thank you.